When it comes to putting ethics into practice, one of the most important things is that you know and accept your ethical responsibilities. You need to read and understand the relevant standards of the APA ethics code for what you're doing. It's one thing that we often take for granted is that the researchers have actually read these standards. Obviously they should have, but that's not necessarily the case. And one very important aspect of knowing and accepting your ethical responsibilities is being able to distinguish minimal risk from at-risk research. So minim minimal risk refers to when there is no increased chance of harm beyond those encountered in daily life. So if your participants are going to be experiencing things in the laboratory that they would do in a normal day-to-day -day basis, that's, that's minimal risk. You know, like if you're just going to have them sit at a computer screen and push buttons on a keyboard, that, that's, that's minimal risk stuff. That's what most people are familiar with. But if you're doing anything besides those kinds of day-to-day -day things, now what you're doing is called at-risk research, where there's greater than normal chances of harm. And you need to know the specific policies and procedures for your institution, including how to prepare and submit a research protocol when it comes to doing minimal risk or at-risk research. So just to give you an example of a minimal risk research study, to test a hypothesis hypothesis regarding memory for strings of numbers, a researcher had her participants do the following in the laboratory. First, they would watch a number sequence shown on the screen. Then they would complete a word search puzzle. That's, that was just like a distraction task to try to you know, get their mind off the numbers. Then after that, they would input the numbers from the previous sequence into a computer using a keyboard. So as you can see, none of this is really all that different from day-to-day -day life. You know, people use keyboards, people try to remember numbers, people do word search puzzles. It's, it's typical stuff. Nothing to worry about. So that would be considered minimal risk. Now, an example of at-risk research would be something like the following. To test a hypothesis regarding marijuana's influence on academic performance, a researcher did the following. She had her participants first complete a standardized aptitude test, then ingest uh, some amount of marijuana, and complete another standardized test. Now, most of the research nowadays makes it very clear marijuana is not such a scary drug. However, most people don't use marijuana. This is not a part of their daily life. Therefore, this is at-risk research. You know, you're, you're, you're putting your participants in a situation that they don't normally experience in a day-to-day -day kind of fashion. Therefore, it is considered at-risk. So all at-risk really means, if you think about it, is not normal. So the, the conditions of your study are not like normal life. And if you do have these kinds of risks in your study, if you are putting participants in a situation that they wouldn't normally experience, you need to first of all list those things that are different from normal life. You need to identify those risks. After you've made that kind of a list of all the different things that are, you know, at risk in your study, the next thing you need to do is try to minimize your risks. Try to eliminate them if possible, or just reduce the potential for harm that they could present. Like maybe in, instead of having your participants ingest, you know, a large amount of marijuana, you could just have them ingest trace amounts of marijuana. It's, it's, a, it's a minor distinction, but it is important to try to minimize those risks as much as you can. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to identifying and minimizing those risks, one issue that often comes up is deception. Deception is used in a lot of research, but it shouldn't be used unless it's necessary. Like if your research design includes any form of deception, whether it's 
active deception or passive deception, you should try to eliminate it if you can. If you, to put it another way, it's only going to be acceptable to use depression if de deception if there's absolutely no other way you could do it. <clears throat> and it is considered acceptable to wait till debriefing before you reveal your research question, but you need to uh, do so as best as you can. You don't want to include any kind of delay. You don't want to include any kind of deception unless it's absolutely necessary. So, so let me give you an example of this. To test the hypothesis that the age of college professors affects people's expectations about them, a researcher informed her participants about what she wanted them to do, but not why. She used deception because knowing the hypothesis in this case is probably going to affect people's decision about whether or not to participate in the study. But it also had the potential to invalidate the results. Like if the participants know that the age is what the uh, researcher is looking for here, it might affect their judgments. They might start focusing on age more so than they would otherwise. Like they might rate the older or younger professors differently because they think that's what is expected of them. So as you can see in this case, it's important that the researcher not give you know all the details. It's important that they have this kind of passive deception. But if it can be eliminated, it should be. Um, and when it comes to doing any kind of ethical research, it's always important to balance risks and benefits. It's important to balance those pros and cons. Like, you do want to make a list of risks, like I was describing earlier, but you should balance that against the list of benefits. Like, if your study is at risk, if there is some potential for harm in your study, there should be a larger potential for benefit. Not just for you, not just for the participants in your study, but benefit to everyone, benefit to anyone. So you need to compare those two lists. And you would do it in a way kind of like this. So let's say one of the obvious benefits of your study is that you're going to advance basic knowledge in science. You're going to you know, discover something interesting about human behavior. So that's clearly a benefit. And that's going to tip the scales in that direction, which is good. But if your study is at risk, those risks are going to tip it back in the other direction. So maybe your participants might feel some physical pain as a result of participating in your study. And maybe you're going to cause some kind of emotional distress, like fear, for example, or humiliation. So if it starts to tip, it, tip back in that direction, now you've got a problem. Now you have to either try to eliminate those risks, and you should try to eliminate those risks, or you should try to rebalance by adding more benefits, by somehow making the study more beneficial to the people involved or the people who will be reading this research later on. Like maybe you could offer incentives. Maybe you could offer like a financial incentive. Because even if a study has the potential to provide great insight, those insights must outweigh the potential for harm. And this is why when we talk about old school experiments like Stanley Milgram's obedience studies, this is why we wouldn't be able to do those studies today. Those studies traumatize the people who participated in them. There's much better ways we could do that kind of research, and modern research has replicated Stanley Milgram's uh, results using far less risk. Now, when it comes to doing uh, scientific research, informed consent is, is a very important aspect psychology. You want to create informed consent and debriefing procedures before you get started just so that all your participants are on the same page. You, but before you do that, of course, there are situations where informed consent might not be required. You should refer to APA standard 8.5 to decide whether or not 
informed consent is required for your study. And if it is required for your study, <clears throat> when you recruit participants, you need to provide them with as much information about the study as you can. Provide a script, like a standardized script. So like I said, all your participants can basically like be on the same page of like talking points and frequently asked questions and things like that. And also obviously create a standard consent form for all your participants to read and sign if they decide to participate in your study. Here's an example of an informed consent uh, form that I developed. So this is for one of my studies that I was working on during my PhD. And you can see it's broken down into a few different sections and it goes into detail about what the participant should expect from being in this study. It describes uh, why they are being recruited, like what the purpose of the study is. It goes into a description of any potential risks they might experience. And then it explains how their information will be kept confidential and what information may be disclosed. And then it just has this brief statement about what it means to consent to participating in this study. So that's the basic idea. When, when participants give this kind of consent, that just means that they are willing to accept any risks that you have outlined. But before any of that, before you do any kind of research whatsoever and get any kind of participants, you first have to get in touch with those institutional review boards, those IRBs. Or in the case of animal research, it would be an IACUC. So you need to get institutional approval for whatever research you're doing. And that approval will then determine whether or not you need to modify your study before you begin or whether you're ready to just go ahead and get started. And this will generally require writing a protocol to describe the purpose of the study, the research design you're going to use, and the procedure that you plan to use any risks and benefits that might be involved and the steps take, that you've taken to try to minimize those risks, and also a copy of the informed consent and debriefing procedures that you plan to use in your study. And then finally, you need to follow through. You know, after you've created all these documents, after you've created all these standards and procedures, you need to put this into practice. You need to stick to your protocol and you need to that you've submitted to this institutional review board. And if you do decide to change anything, then you'll have to get additional approval. You'll have to go back to them, maybe write a new proposal to them if your study has ch changed in any substantial way. And during your research, you should monitor your participants for any unexpected, any unanticipated reactions. You know, you can't predict everything that could possibly happen new risks might pop up in the middle of your study and you need to be prepared to recognize that and adapt. Uh, a good example of uh, studies that didn't adapt in this way would be like uh, Zimbardo's prison experiment, the, the prison experiment you might be familiar with. They did this study, they were planning to do this study for I believe it was just a couple of weeks, but things went downhill pretty fast and students started suffering substantially and Zimbardo didn't recognize what was happening until people had already been severely affected. So you just you need to pay attention to what's happening in your study for any risks that may pop up. And when it comes to publishing your results you need to make sure you discuss all these issues with the other authors that might be involved. Like when it comes to who gets first credit, who gets the most credit, and who gets the least credit, and what people get credit for. All this stuff should be taken care of before you send your paper out for publication, just to avoid any potential for conflict. And obviously, this, this should go without being said, obviously you need to make sure all your data is factual all your data is accurate to exactly how you collected it. Any amount of fabrication in your data could result in severe consequences, not just for that potential, or that potential publication that you're trying to get out, but for your career as a whole. Researchers who are caught fabricating data, their career is basically 
over.